Okay, so first of all, I want to thank, every, there's been such an outpouring of love and care and prayer. And I feel so strengthened by, by, by it all. And here in Israel and in the States. And I know that so many people have our back. And I know that Hashem has our back. And um, it's been, there have been times that I feel broken. Mostly I feel very hopeful. And, and I really feel like the grandmother role made me come into a kind of a place that my children expect support and wisdom and to 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 see that the way is is forged for them and you know even though the way is not certain yet but the knowledge that there is a way to go and so I've been trying to have that role I think I think our role as grandmothers you know there's a word in Hebrew called matefet it's like to wrap to envelop like to envelop is very is is critical and fundamental and I pray to Hashem that you know, I could fulfill that role of mine to the best of my ability. Um, so Malka and I both are doing each our separate avodot. We had a phone conversation of like a half hour with Michal Peretz um, when we were in the hospital after we heard like the final news. And I wanna, um, I wanna share with you the avodah that she's doing, the avodah that I'm doing. And first of all, I just want to tell everyone what, what has happened since, um, since Sukkot. So, so Sukkot, the baby was three months old. And, we, and I, when I went to Malka's house, I noticed that like, the baby really didn't grow. She was responding and smiling and lifting up her head and looking strong, but she, she really didn't grow. And the truth is, is she slept really a lot. Rhonda just asked me, am I teaching? And I want to just tell her, uh, yes, this very second. Hold on one minute. Um, yes, now. Okay, good. Um, and so I told Malka, let's take her to, in Israel, they have something called Tipat Chalav that you take the baby every month to see how they grow, which we usually don't even do because you're nursing, you see them growing, they go from diapers of zero to one, from one to two, you know, three months old, they, they graduate into the three to six months as opposed to infant to three months. But over here, she was staying with the same diapers, same clothes, but she was developing like mentally fine. So we went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, something is a bit awry. Try to wake her up every two, three hours and feed her every two, three hours, which Malka tried doing. And it really didn't take us anywhere. The baby wanted to sleep. Um, so after a week of that, the doctor said, let's go to the hospital and the hospital, they have like an out clinic. It's called, um, it's called, uh, what is, oh, FTT clinic. It's called failure to thrive clinic, FTT. And then over there, they had an amazing physical therapist, nursing, her name is Diklat, nursing expert that try to teach Malka like different ways to position her and to let the baby become hungry before you feed her and try to maybe introduce solids. And we did that for a week. We, we come back and she hasn't gone up. So they said, you know what? Let's hospitalize her and just tube feed her with the mother's milk, which is what we did. And with all that, you know, she still wasn't really going up. And when we tried to nurse her before, when Malka would try to nurse her before the tube feeding, she was never hungry. So Malka and I would actually walk around the children's ward and say, we're so lucky because it seems like Michal Levona is like the lightest case here, the lightest case scenario. And, and we'd feel very blessed. And then I had a huge bar mitzvah from Wednesday to Sunday, Tuesday to Sunday. And I told Malka, those five days, I'm just not going to be available. I'm not going to be here. But all your friends and your sisters and everyone's available to you. And make use of everyone. If you really need me, I'm here for you. Like, I'll just drop everything and come. But I try to have her know that, you know, for five days, I'm going to be crazy busy. 
And on Thursday, she noticed the baby's eyes starting to like not focus. And she told me, you know, I noticed that the baby's eyes not focusing that much. I said, just tell the doctor. Like, I, I figured you might as well tell everything to the doctor. If we're in this incredible hospital that's called Schneider, the best one in the Middle East and doctors that are just really angels is all I could say about them. Caring and loving and and very all heart, all heart. And also beautiful grounds. Like when we'd go, we'd sit on the grass, we'd put the baby to get vitamin D. So the minute Malka noticed it, they went to give her an ultrasound. And I just want to say that previously they did an ultrasound, um, they ultrasound her heart, her intestines. And the reason they didn't do the brain is because she just seemed really alert and with it and cognitively there. And so anyway, in the ultrasound, they found a mass and then they did a MRI and the MRI, they found a growth on her hypothalamus, which is a little, is connected to her like eating, sleeping sight, which it secretes hormones that regulate the sleep and the sight and the, and, and the food. And it turns out that when they started tube feeding her and she did start to gain weight. So something about the weight gain, I don't know if the tumor got bigger or things expanded in the brain. Um, that's why her eyes started to like be non-focused. And that's what they discovered that she has. And um, and she was operated on to for a biopsy. And in the operation, they realized that um, there's fluids in her brain that is causing the brain to expand and the fluid is not being released. So they put like, I think it's called a shunt from the brain to her in, to her stomach. And it means that let's say she could never go through like all these metal detectors because it's it's um, metallically, magnetically, you know, controlled. And uh, the baby was in intensive care, had a hard two days. It was painful. Malka and Or stayed together. I was with the children. And today, thank God, she is in less, she's not in pain. She is looking around, even smiling a little bit, um, to, got her out of the ICU. And by Monday, we should know more uh, as to the type of tumor it is and what our next steps are. And, and that's, that's where we stand. Um, with all that being said, I also believe that there is avodot that we can do on ourselves and that avoda will go to the um, like to the health of the baby. In other words, anything that we change within us, something is going to change with the baby as well. So I wanted to speak to Michal Peretz about um, about where she feels like maybe Malka's avoda is and my avoda is, and. Um, and it, and, it, and it charts a path for you. Like it prepares you for a path. Whenever we hit, whenever we're hit with like um, a, a huge wake up call, first of all, we know that this wake up call could bring us to higher, you know, it's like a Sulam Yaakov, Yaakov's ladder. What is Yaakov's ladder? Yaakov's ladder is he's looking and, and it's a ladder that leads upwards that we try to climb every step on the ladder and try to build ourselves in that way to get closer to Hashem. And so I was wondering if Malka had an avodah and I had an avodah that could bring us closer to Hashem. And any avodah that we do is going to be for my granddaughter to be healed, to join the family again, to have you know a life filled with happiness, filled with um, joy and togetherness, and filled with health and filled with Hashem, a life really filled with Hashem. So I got Michal Peretz on the phone and she started talking to Malka. And she asked her, 
you know, when you got pregnant with the baby, how did you feel? So Malka said, you want to know the truth? The truth is, is that I have four children and I wanted to take a small break to develop my art and my studio and my clients and classes. Like I give classes to families. And I have to tell you that I was like a little bit disappointed because I really wanted, you know, after having four children very close, I wanted to have some time off. And it took me a while to get used to the idea. So Michal asked her, you know, why can't you do both? Like, why can't you have, you know, also be an art teacher and see students and be an art therapist and, and also be a mother? Like, why does one contradict the other? And Malika said, you know, I try to have my kids home until they're a year old and I, I, I give myself fully to them. And yeah, this job, I also want to give myself fully to that. And I just can't do everything and I can't do both. And I just wanted to have time. So Michal said, she asked her a question, does this manifest itself in other, um, in other areas of your life? And Malka said, I have to tell you that in all areas of my life, this is the way I feel. I feel like anything that I do comes at the expense of something else. Anything that I choose, there's something else that I feel like I needed to choose because everything is falling through the cracks. Like if I decide that I'm going to go do the dishes, I feel bad that I'm not with the children. If I decide that I'm going to be with the children, I feel like, oh my God, the house is a wreck. If I'm doing the dishes, I feel like I should be cooking. If I'm seeing clients, I feel like my children need me. So I live in a world, this is what Malika was saying. I live in a world where I feel like everything is coming at the expense of everything else, which is why I felt disappointed. And it took me a couple of months to come to terms with the fact that I'm pregnant and that, you know, and, and, and that this child is coming into the family. And not only that, but when the baby, Michalov, when I was born, she slept so much that I felt like she was, um, sorry, I just hear someone uh, who came in, who is, hold on one minute. Let me just mute off again. Okay, sorry, I muted everyone. Um, and, and also when she was born, like she slept so much and she needed so little. And, and I started, you know, and it made it easy for me to start working as an art therapist again. <laughs> so Michal said that, and this is something we've been learning a very long time, but it was definitely sharpened that in order for us to live hand in hand with God, we need to be choosing woman. We need to be choosing Jewish woman. What does it mean choosing to be a Jewish woman or to be a, cho a choosing Jewish woman? It means that when I have two possibilities, I want to be with my children and I want to do the dishes. I need to ask myself, um, these are two parts of me. One is the part that wants the house to be clean and organized and inviting and 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 beautiful to look at and one is I want to be with my children and enjoy them and play with them and listen to them and and it's the mother and it's the housekeeper those are the two those are the two parts in me and those are two very important parts and very precious parts and every single and, and every one of those parts um is is who I am now at any given point I need to choose do I want to be now doing the dishes or with my children? Do I want to do now, be, be like a therapist or with my children? Do I want to cook or do I want to do laundry? Like just giving examples from Alka's life. These are her. And whatever I choose, I, I need to choose one thing. And whatever I choose, I need to know that Hashem is with me in that. He's with me in that and only in that. And what's going to happen with the other things? Hashem is with that also, but I'm with Hashem now in what I chose. And God willing, God is going to take care of the, the thing that was left. Let's say I decided that I'm doing my dishes. And so the kids are going to take care of themselves and they're going to learn how to 
play by themselves and they're going to learn how to read and to be alone and to occupy themselves. And, and that's fine. That's going to be their development. But you need to know that when you choose one thing, your mind can't go into the other thing because then it means that we're in this world without God because we're being torn. And when we're torn, Hashem is not with us. It's like we're saying, I don't know if I picked the right thing. I don't know if I did the right thing. I don't know what the right thing to do is. But what Hashem wants us to do is decide what we want to do and, and walk with him hand in hand and do it and not go back to, oh, but I should have done this, but maybe I should do that. But And now I'm not only talking about, I'm not only talking about Malka's dilemma that is constant between, you know, children, career, children, home, children, whatever it is she has. I'm talking about every one of us that feels like whenever we choose something, something else is lost. Now, nothing is ever, ever lost. I, I, I was remembering myself telling Malka when she was telling me that she was disappointed. I said, Malka, this is the time to raise your children. If you could do a little art here and there, great. And then the art years, they're going to come. Like God willing, we, we live, you know, in this day and age, we live till the age of, of 80, 90, 100, like the, the, the lifespan has been expanding and there's so much, there's so much many more years after we have our children um, to be able to actualize ourselves. And nothing ever comes at the expense of anything else. The minute you pick something, Hashem is with you and, and Hashem is gonna take care of the other thing also. So. Walking in this world without choosing is literally being like, it's like a slingshot in hell. There's, there's, there's this kind of saying in Hebrew, like you're a slingshot in hell that is, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You're always, no matter what you do, and it's, it's, it's something that rips you apart. And Michal was asking Malka, for her to, to be able to do teshuva. Do teshuva means to return to the straight path that we're supposed to be in of the ability to choose one thing and, and do it and be with it fully. And Hashem chose for Malka to have this baby. And so Malka needs to embrace it and love it and know that this is like, it's like Michal was saying, imagine, imagine we're in Buckingham Palace and Kate Middleton and her husband, I don't know his name, um, and you're a cook there and they're, they watch the way you function and they call you and they tell you, you know what, we really realized that you're a very fine person and we'd like to have you be in, with the fact that you're you know, the cook, we like you to teach our son how to read and how to socialize because you have such a fine qualities about you that we'd like him to be part, like we'd like you to be part of his life. So anyone would feel so flattered, jump at the opportunity and go teach the king's son, you know, also how to read and also how to socialize and just feel so proud that this was given to his at his doorstep. And she was saying, this is also your story. God, the King put this neshama in your life and it's bigger than any work of art you'll ever do. It's the actual ultimate work of art on this planet. And, and you need to know that when you're, go, you're doing it, you're not missing anything else. There's nothing out there that we're missing. We can't walk around this earth feeling like I chose one thing, and but something else ran away. That something else never ran away. It wasn't meant to be. God's taking care of it. <laughs> it it's time will come, like a million things. But we want to have, we want to be holding Hashem's hands when we choose whatever we choose and know that that's the only choice we had. There's no other thing that we're, missing and I should have and I could have and maybe and 
and and that's just these are just thoughts and feelings that rip at us um don't allow us to climb up to Hashem because we're constantly walking in this world bewildered and um feeling like we're missing out on something feeling like something is we're being robbed of something you know i i went to i, I went to uh norway i didn't go to switzerland should i've gone to switzerland i missed that i missed like once you pick something you're there with hashem 100 percent. and so that's malka's avoda that she is taking on herself and She's trying to figure it out also because living in a way of constantly feeling like, oh, I didn't go visit my parents because I went to cook. I should have gone to them and I shouldn't have gone to the supermarket. I should have taken them to the doctor, but I went on vacation. Like living that way is, is um, not living with God. It's not, it's, it's telling God the work, the world that you created is so imperfect is a world where I'm always torn, is a world where I feel like I'm always losing out. And, and that's not the type of world that Hashem created. Hashem created a world that is filled with abundance, that is filled with um, options, that is filled with choices that we could make and take pleasure in and take pleasure in every choice we make. Did I say that this class is for the healing of Michal Avon Abba Malka? I'm saying it if I didn't. Um, okay, now coming to my avoda. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm ending Malka's part and I'm going to my part. But before I end Malka's part, I want to just say that to try to change, to try to relinquish that, to try to incorporate into our lives the choice that we make to be happy with it and shalem, whole with it and content with it. And, and by the way, I always, we always have to really choose our emet because emet is Hashem's name. And only when we choose our emet, he's with us. Emet, not what is my parents going to say if I don't? What is my sister going to say that I didn't? What if, you know, what are they going to think if, if, if I choose otherwise? No, it has to be our emet. And then, and then relinquish it, Tasha. But in order to gain that kind of, um, it's, 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 a, it's a very high level to be in. It's, it's a high level to be in. And we need to pray a lot in order to relinquish the feeling of loss that, oh, I chose one thing, but I didn't have the other. And when I say relinquish, when we open up drawers and we see, you know, oh, maybe I should keep this and I might need it and who knows and whatever. When we open up drawers and we try to see how they reflect us, oftentimes we'll say, oh, I might need it and I, maybe I should keep it and who knows and maybe and, um, you know, we're, we're scared to relinquish all these extraneous things and the extraneous thoughts. Basically, what we don't, what we don't relinquish, are those thoughts that are plaguing us, <clears throat> and um, so we really want to to pray to Hashem to take that away from us. Hold on. We we want it, it. It's a lot of tefillot, and if anyone wants to take on that avodah on themselves to be able to pray for it work on it, realize it, start that path. So do it also for the healing of Micha Levona, please. If if you want to decide to take that kind of avodah on yourself. <clears throat> and now I want to get to mine. So she asked me, you know, um, oh, Okay, what she asked me really piggybacks on something that Malka told her. Wait, hold on one second. I just want to see if it's Malka. One minute. Hello? Who is this? Oh, hi, Danielle. Hi. I'm in the middle of giving a class 
Can I call you back literally in 20 minutes? This is the number. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. This is actually a holistic doctor in the States that I wanted to talk to about the situation because we were basically told that in the best possible scenario, <coughs> what would be is that the tumor is benign and she would need chemotherapy because they can't operate it to have a delicate spot and they don't do radiation at this age. So she might have to go through chemo. And I just... I'm, I'm trying to see what a holistic doctor would say about it, even though we don't have all the information yet because only Monday we're going to know. And I do know that the best possible scenario is all in Hashem's hands. It, it really is. So um, Michal asked Malka, you know, how does your house look like? And Malka said, it's a mess. Like we pick something up and we don't put it in place. We just put it down. And she asked her like, why don't you put it away? She said, because I'm on to the next thing. Cause I, you know, cause I, I just, let's say I took off my jacket, but he needs to go to the bathroom. So I throw it down and then another one needs something else. And then I'm feeding them. So I'm quickly giving, but I don't put away the pot. And, and so Michal asked me like, what, 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 what do I want to work on? Now, something that I worked on myself is when I ha had this big bar mitzvah, I usually become sick before I get herpes because I'm so nervous. I want things to run right. And I put a lot of time and energy and effort into it. And, and I want to, and I want to look good. Like I want to look good in terms of, oh, she did a great job and this is the way I make my living. And then I'll get more, um, I'll get more referrals and, and I want people are coming and spending tons of money and I want them to enjoy Israel and have a good time and feel like Israel is a great place where, uh, you know, they could get good service and they'll come back again and their children will be inspired and all that created so much pressure that I usually broke out in herpes. And it's an avodah that I did to relinquish it really to Hashem, to say, I'm doing what I can. And Hashem, you take care of the rest. And Michal calls that, do we want people, when we do anything, do we want people to see Hashem? Or do we want people to see us? Like if we want them to see us, that it's all about us, then we're stressed and worried. And, but if it's about, look how Hashem organized this, you know, to organize this, you know, and it got done and taken over in the best possible way. And we were able to see his hands. It's like, I don't want people to say, oh my God, she's so uh, amazingly with it and organized and, and competent. And no, we're not here in this world to show us. We're here in this world to show him. So I, I was telling Michal, piggybacking on what Malka said, my room in the hotel that I took was a flying mess because I was, I didn't give myself a minute to fold my clothes and put it in the, and put it in the suitcase or fold my hair coverings and roll it up and put it neatly because I was always like rushing, rushing because something else needed my attention and I needed to make sure that everything was being done properly. And to cap it all, um, the last day, which was a Sunday, and that was the day that um, they did the, it, so first of all, I didn't know. Sunday was the last day that they were there. And Sunday morning, she went for the ultrasound. Immediately they saw it and immediately they sent her into the MRI. And Malka called me up after the ultrasound between the MRI which was like 11 o'clock in the morning, but already knowing that something's wrong. And um, that morning with my group, the finale was a finale brunch. And the mother had, um, the mother had, um, how do you say? Oh, throughout the trip, she had pictures taken of different families and then she had them like embedded in this glass frame and in back of this glass frame that the picture was embedded in um and it was a rush job she put thank you notes from the bar mitzvah boys uh from the bar mitzvah boy like he thanked everyone for coming for his bar mitzvah and that was like the memento and she said when people come into brunch i'd like it to have on a table ready now i had hostesses who were working for me and brunch was supposed to be like at 10 30. And so the, I guess I was to come 9 30, but she came 10, figuring she's going to have enough time. And 
from here to there, people started to come in and the table wasn't ready yet. Like we were still, you know, sticking the table and whatever. And I was burning. I was like under my breath telling her, you were expected to be here in 930. I don't understand why you came at 10. Like, and what was my thought? What are they going to think? And I wish it was organized and I wish it was perfect. And I wish everything went seamless and fell into place. And why do people have to come? And we're still sticking in the, the, the you know, the, this is all happening while my granddaughter, me not knowing is going for her ultrasound. And, and very much my avodah is going to be, and I want to take it on myself that I want to be able to do, which by the way, I got herpes at the end of the bar mitzvah. Um, very little, not not huge, big blow up. So I know that I have progressed to a certain extent. But my avodah is, I want to be able to do to my strength, to get as much help as I need, and to know that Hashem is going to take care of the rest, that I'm here to show him. I'm not here to show me. Um, it's in his hands. Okay, so they came in and all the things weren't, so what? Like, is that worth saying a, you know, hurtful word to anyone? Um, is that worth, like, it's so important for me that people look and see what a perfect job I did. But I think the important thing is for them to look and see what a perfect job Hashem did. Um, it's in his hands nothing is in our hands. You know, he gave us the strength to do to our capacity. And we need to walk in this world, not stressed, not overworked, not, um, you know, feeling like the weight of the world is on our so shoulders. We, 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 we need to walk in this world um, with happiness, with the knowledge that he's good, that his hand is on, on us all the time, that we are here to grow. We're here to expand. Um, and, and that all these, all these nisyonot that are coming to our lives are here to, to make us grow. And I look at it now, like my move to Tel Aviv, let's say, where I looked at it as, you know, I wasn't crazy about doing it, but I did it anyway. And now I just see it as such a big blessing that I'm here. The hospital's 15 minutes away from my house. My grandchildren are, you know, 40 minutes away. Um, I could be on call. I can drive. I'm there. Um, for my granddaughter to, 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 to be better and to heal herself, for Hashem to heal her, like I stay and tell me the rest of my life and live in this apartment and, you know, so far away from what I ever dreamed for and wanted. And, but I would do it gladly in order for her to make a full recovery, to come back to the family, to grow up, to be a happy, lively, dancing, running, smiling child. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say. And that is that any situation we're put, we have a shlichut. And I see that anywhere I go, whether it's in the hospital, whether it's other parents, whether, you know, just even finding a parking spot and smiling at the man that, that cleared the spot for me or coming out of my car and walking to the hospital, just smiling at the people around me and um, talking to people who are there who, and everyone has their package of what they're dealing with. And knowing that anywhere I go, there's blessings to be given to people. I was in the ICU when there were first time parents that were there and I was able to bless them. Like, I hope you never walk into hospital again, see a hospital, um, you know, that your son will just be strong and you'll be able to raise him to learn Torah. Um, and so anywhere we're put, I want us to be able to, to be messengers of Hashem, to be able to give our blessings to everyone, to be able to smile at everyone, to be able to have a good word, a kind word, a, a, a shining countenance. It's what we want Hashem to do on us. So we're going to do it to everyone around us. 
and um and that's that's where i am that's that's where i'm holding and i'm so <laughs> there were so many things at the bar mitzvah i wanted to share with you but it's already irrelevant now because this is just such a biggie just one little thing i want to share about the bar mitzvah is that i feel like something that's lacking with children first of all lacking is the fact that they have so much screens and screen time and and it's so addictive it's like a drug and um and the other thing that's lacking is that parents so want their children to be happy that they're not willing to say no and set limits and set boundaries in a very in a very respectful way but you know kids don't always have to get what they want um no is is a very important word to start them on the road of going of 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 getting a strength to deal with life right like to gaining resilience to deal with this world that hashem put us in it's a world of challenge and hearing no is definitely something that that makes us more resilient and i was going to give a whole class about that from the bar mitzvah but but i think this is more current and and relevant in my life and um anyone that wants to you know ask any questions i'm open to it i pretty much bared it all here and i'm Ima, I feel very grateful i have a that... question go ahead go ahead okay hi um first of all i think we all agree that the fact that you know we're all going through this and you're doing avador on yourself is really remarkable um thank you for sharing the avador i completely identify with them um it's November, November still, and I'm being torn apart with January. Um, how much do I work? Do I stay home with Michal? So thank you for all the insights. Now I'm going to sit and use those new tools to think about it and come to a decision or I'm not going to be torn. Um, I have a question on something you said. So you were talking about how Marco was saying that her house is a mess. And when you were working that week, you came back to your Airbnb and the house was flying. So last week also, I was doing bar mitzvah all week. I come home and my house is flying things everywhere. Now, on the one hand, I said, wow, how beautiful that my house is flying. That means that I'm working. It means that I have a child that's throwing things out of the drawers all over the place. So I really looked at it and I said, wow, that's so nice. Um, but on the other hand, it still bothers me and I want my house to not be flying and I'm not going to say it's only when I'm working because sometimes I come home and there's dishes in the sink and there's toys all over the floor and I don't want to live in a house like that but then it's like but I'm choosing to go to the park with my daughter instead of cleaning because something uh, I'm making the choice but then should I instead say no but I can't have a flying house so I need to do one thing at a time and not start cooking dinner if there's still dishes in the sink from lunch. Like, where's the balance between um, choosing to ignore the mess and I don't care, slash maybe I shouldn't even get to the mess and, and be doing one thing at a time instead of 50 things at a time. Okay, so when you choose to do something, let's say you choose to go to the park. So at that point in your mind, the mess doesn't exist anymore. You can't be in the park with Michal and your mind is in the mess the mess is is going to be taken care of by god and when i mean by god i mean that you you chose to be with michael in the park or you chose to do the dishes whatever it is that you did let's say you know let's say you chose to do the dishes because you want the house to be clean michael will be able to um how do you say to uh be massy herself how do you say that in english to entertain keep herself, herself busy. yeah mm -hmm. to keep herself busy to entertain herself it, you, you're not the source of her, you know, well-being and happiness at all times. She also can do it on her own. And you chose to be in the dishes and now you're in the, in the dishes. And now Michal is with God. Like she's, you know, she's finding herself. When I say she's with God is I mean she's discovering herself. When we are by ourselves, we discover ourselves. If you chose to go to the park, nothing is running away. David might cut home and do it. Someone might come home and help you later that night you'll do it the next morning it, it'll be done like there'll be a point that it'll be done the most important thing though is the choice that we make 
and this is the whole thing with mindfulness, which is a whole hit kind of a, you know, very in kind of a thing, um, is wherever we are, let's just be there. Let's not have a split personality because what we chose, when Hashem says, Hashem told us, you know, we tell Hashem, He chose us and we're the chosen people. So when Hashem has us choose and, and that's like the core of our existence. Choosing is the core of our existence. So when he, when he has us choosing, um, he, he has us going with him hand in hand. And when we leave the park in our heads and go to the dishes, or we leave, you know, let's say we're doing the dishes and we are feeling guilty that we're not with the child, that we just, um, that, that we're just letting go of his hand. So. So we need to pretty much decide what we want to do and then run with it and then run with it as if nothing else existed. As so that's a really great answer that we need to just own our choices and then there's no turmoil and guilt. Like if a, when you said that if I do the dishes, Michal entertain herself. So this morning I wanted to take her to the park. I said she's ready up for an hour, but I was so hungry. And I wanted to make myself toast. And it takes time to take bread out of the freezer and heat it up. I said, oh, but she really needs to go to the park. And then I said, what am I, crazy? Why do I need to starve? So she'll stay in the house for five more minutes, play with a toy in the house, and then we'll go. And I said, it's such a basic need. My body is telling me you need food and I'm, and I'm going to ignore it to take her to the park. So I made myself the sandwich and she was fine. So you're right. It's so, but- it's so valuable what you're doing. Because I remember as a mother, I used to not go to the bathroom. I would hold it in. It's like ignoring the calls of my body and then and then we wonder like why do our children ignore you know the calls of their body yeah mamash all right and i said if i go to the park and i'm starving the whole time i'm going to be miserable because i didn't eat my head would be in the sandwich totally yeah totally wow um thank you (laughs) thank you thanks adele anyone else has questions oh i want to say one more thing um, Malka's rabbi called her up today. Her rabbi, who's also mine, his name is Rav Yair Dreyfus. He is in Yeshivat Siach in Efrat. Um, we love him, and we, you know, we used to go to a lot of his classes when we lived in the Gush. But I immediately, when I heard the news, I called her up, and I called him up, and he spoke to me, and he said that he wants to speak to Malka, and he spoke to her today. And Malka asked him, you know, why is this happening? Why is my daughter suffering? I want to know why. And he told her, Malka, I don't ask why in this world. I decide to live with faith that that God is good and everything is here for the good and everything here is to have us grow. And why is not a question I ask. I don't ask that anymore, ever. And I want you to be able to enjoy the baby every day as it comes, you know, take what the day has to offer, live in the day. And, and, you know, that was, I, that, this is the gist that I got from Malka of what, what, you know, she told me, and he also told her, you need to take care of yourself. You know, what do you like to do? He asked her, she said, I like to bike ride. I like to paint. He said, bring your canvas to the hospital, start painting, go out bike riding, take, care of yourself um you know we we so easily just dive into our um jobs as mothers and we it's like a totality it's so total it takes us over and and he's saying you're the first one that needs to be taken care of um so that was you know a uh, message from her rabbi anyway and i have to also say another thing that there are times at night that my head starts taking me into demyonot of worst possible scenarios. And I really have to pray hard for it not to happen. And for, you know, to imagine the best case scenario, dancing at her wedding, uh, doing a su'udat uh, for her, um, you know, having her running and dancing with her siblings who are so missing her and looking forward to her coming back, especially Ayala Khan. Ayala Khan has three brothers and this was her her sister that was finally born, the sister that she was hoping and wishing and praying for. 
and we need to make her aware that we need her here healthy and we talk to her and I, I really believe that the more we imagine on how amazing things could be, the more they, they our thoughts could make things happen. Our thoughts could make things happen. We will think it and it will happen. We will think it and it will be. And, and then even if God forbid it doesn't, but the thoughts are amazing. <laughs> It's great to have these thoughts anyway. It's a good way to live. It's a good way to function. It's a good way to, you know, to live in Hashem's world. I could say that I've never been in so much pain before. I, Malka's never certainly. Um, it's wow. It's, it's a wow. It's a wow. Mamash. Anyone else? Any comments, questions? Okay. Micha? Yeah, Reans. It's Rhonda. Rhonda. I'm on, Rini. I don't know if you could see me. See me? No, I just want to say that we love you. I love you so much. And we're all praying. I feel it. I'm all with you. And we're all with you. Okay. Any, any, I just want to ask everyone, any Afoda that anyone chooses to take, take it upon themselves and say it's for the healing of Michal Evonaba Malka. Um, and there's so many Afoda we do all the time. And, and let's, I, I want it to be for her, if we can, for the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ketsura.